Join us now for Education Matters, a weekly look at the real people and real stories in education across North Carolina. Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm Keith Poston. The North Carolina Innovative School District, formerly known as the Achievement School District, was created by the General Assembly in 2016. Modeled after similar initiatives in Tennessee and Louisiana, its stated goal is to improve low-performing schools across the state by taking over the operations of the schools and handing them over to charter school operators. An initial list of 48 schools under consideration is now down to six schools. The plan, however, is getting serious pushback from some local communities, including Durham, which has two schools on the short list. We're going to talk with local leaders from Durham today on the show. Before we tackle our main topic, we open with headlines, a quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. As the General Assembly reconvenes this week, much of the chatter around education policy centers on the new principal pay plan they just passed a few weeks ago. As we covered on last week's show, concerns have been raised about the number of principals, particularly veteran school leaders, who may lose pay under a plan that was touted as a pay raise for principals. Legislators are expected to discuss technical changes and corrections to the plan to address what they describe as unintended consequences. Now, no principal has lost pay yet while a one-year hold harmless provision is in place. It seems likely legislators will extend that hold harmless provision. Less clear is the plan itself, which overhauls the way principals are paid, tying compensation to annual growth metrics and student achievement while eliminating pay increases based on experience level or advanced degrees. We'll see if those have changed too. In August, the UNC system released its yearly figures on enrollment at their teacher preparation programs, showing a 6% increase, the first jump since 2010. Or was it? A new look at the data by online education news outlet at NC found that the reporting methods used this year differed from previous years. While overall enrollment did increase by 6%, a new category was added called Other that accounted for almost all of the growth from 2015 to 2016. Other includes lateral entry teachers as well as teachers earning specialized certificates in areas like gifted education and other non-degree seeking elements that had not been counted before. The Other category grew more than total enrollment, meaning there was actually a drop in enrollment again in the system's core teacher preparation programs. The UNC system is the single largest source of teachers for North Carolina's public schools. Total enrollment in its teacher prep programs is down 25% since 2010. Finally, some good news out of the College Board. North Carolina's graduating class of 2017 posted an average score of 1081 on the new SAT exam, 21 points above the national average. The number of students taking at least one AP exam also increased almost 7% from the previous year also above the national average. More importantly, North Carolina students saw a 6% increase in the percentage of students scoring three or higher on the tests. The cutoff for college credit at most universities is three. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum's website at ncforum.org, click Education Matters, and read more about each of the headlines as well as the other topics we cover each week. As I said at the top of the show, we're going to talk about the new North Carolina Innovative School District and the pushback that's coming from some local communities where schools are targeted for takeover. Joining us in the first segment, we have Wendy Jacobs. Wendy is the chair of the Durham Board of Commissioners. She's also a former classroom teacher and a Durham Public Schools parent times three. Also joining us is Mike Lee. Mike is the chairman of the Durham Board of Education. He's, in, he's served on the Board of Education in Durham for four years, two as chairman. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, I want to start with you because the, the Durham Board of Education uh, took a position fairly early on, even before the, the, the schools were, were sort of narrowed down to the six, including two in Durham. Why, did this, why is the school board um, opposed to the innovative school district taking over schools in Durham? Well, in Durham and the Durham Board of Education, we actually believe that the, the best outcomes of education can come from our communities and from our schools within our system itself. The Innovative School District is an experiment that's failed in other states, and we don't want that experiment here in Durham. Right. Now, um, now Wendy, you, um, the, the county commissioners, um, jumped into the fray, um, I guess maybe about a week ago or so, uh, maybe a little longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the same question to you that I just asked um, Chairman Lee. Uh, why did the Board of Commissioners feel that they wanted to take a position saying this is not something that we want to see in Durham? 
Well, the Durham County Board of Commissioners are responsible for funding, all the local funding for our schools. And ultimately, we're responsible for accountability for those funds. And uh, so it's important for us to have as much local control about education and funding as possible. Well, that, that's actually, that's, you raised the question about funding, and that was one uh, I wanted to ask you about. The, the, the model for the Innovative School District, uh, which is then used in other states, would have uh, charter school operators are currently looking for, um, you know, probably for-profit charter operators. Mm -hmm. will, will take over um, uh, schools, would take over schools in Durham if selected. They would have total control over staffing, um, over all the operations, the curriculum within the school, but the county commissioners would still be responsible for funding it, right? They'd still be responsible for the uh, for transportation, for furniture, mm -hmm. for the building. That's right. So that's a problem. <laughs> well, I can that's understand. That's a problem that we would not ultimately have control over how those funds are used. Right. Now, Mike, uh, one of the things that um, you've obviously looked at what's happened in other states. Um, mm -hmm. One of the knocks on this model, certainly in Tennessee, was the lack of community engagement and buy-in in the process. That's right. Does it bother you that, um, that the school board, the superintendent, we've got, we're going to talk to parents and PTA next, all said we don't want this, but, it, um, but the state moved ahead anyway. Does that, does that concern you? It absolutely concerns me. Uh, Dr. Eric Hall continues to say he wants it to be a partnership. But the type of meetings and the, um, the, the short notifications and the, the quick uh, communications shows that they're not really interested in a input from Durham County or being a partnership. We know it's a state takeover. And this is not a, an, a new idea for them to try to increase school performance. This has been happening. This is, a, this is an end result of a bunch of things that's been happening in, in our legislature to degrade public education, and now we're at this point. I think this was an end goal, and the other things that the, geo, that the state legislature wanted to do actually led to this. I don't think this is a partnership at all. I don't think they're interested in a partnership. I think that's optics. Well, you, what has been your involvement? I mean, I mean, like, I guess when did, did, when did you know um, that Durham was on the list? Was it, were you consulted? Did uh, they come and visit the school system, talk to the schools before um, you made the, the final list? Absolutely not. So when we found out, uh, we found out when everyone else did, when they released a list of 46, that we were actually on the list. Our five, five of our schools were on the list. One was eliminated uh, because of a previous uh, school improvement grant that happened. But then the final list came out. We found out about that final list the exact same time everyone else did when it hit the media. The only contact I've had with them was a, a very short, maybe 30-minute meeting with Dr. Eric Hall uh, last, thir uh, last Wednesday, okay. uh, 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 on a Wednesday last week. And um, we briefly spoke, nothing specific. He didn't know anything about uh, community meetings or school meetings. And then surprisingly, at that two days later, a school meeting happened. So um, I don't think it's a partnership at all. The communication has been terrible. Chair Jacobs, same experience? Uh, we have received no information about uh, the, the plan and the, and the Nibation School District, any plans involving um, Durham Public Schools, no, no formal. All right, now, to, now, now let me ask you this. Now, to be fair, mm -hmm. I mean, these, these, the schools that were selected, mm -hmm. that made the list, were, were schools that, had, that were deemed as chronically low-performing right, schools. Now, right. we, can, we can get into whether the right. measures themselves, I mean, right. I think we've talked about that right. on the show. Right. But these are schools that, that have mm -hmm. um, uh, fairly poor achievement results right. for their students. Right. Um, does right. that, do you think something needs to be done, or is it already happening? Well, we, we, we agree that we want to see all of our children succeeding, and we are concerned. But the point is that we have a process that's already in place now. These two specific schools were approved to be restart schools in July, um, which actually gives them the same flexibility that charter schools have. We have, uh, so where there's a process in place that we're gonna get the flexibility uh, of management uh, and curriculum that charters have so there's no benefit right. to bringing in an outside operator to come in uh, that has the flexibility of charters when we are going to have that now. 
and we just haven't been even given a chance to implement that. Uh, Lakewood Elementary School, for example, just got a brand new principal, an awesome principal. Uh, we've got great parents there, great PTA. Um, that's what's important. Right. Last word for yeah. you, Mike. Um, she mentioned the new principal. You have, comp as a chair of the Board of Education, you have confidence in uh, the leadership and the, the staff at the, well, not just at the two schools, but all the schools that you're responsible for as chair. Do you feel like that you're on the right track? We have absolute confidence in our leadership in our schools and in our administration right. to lead the schools to the direction that we need to, and especially with the um, new restart program. And now finally levels the playing field between charter school legislation and traditional public schools uh, with the regu regulation. And so you, you just, just, just to clarify for our guests uh, as we wrap up, you, this, these schools that are on the list were granted a lot of flexibility and you're now just starting the, this would have been the year mm -hmm. to start doing that, right? That's correct. This is our plan, this is our planning year. The restart program allows for a planning year to get to see what options each school will take care, uh, take option of. And um, from that point, we'll use those flexibilities to see about turning around the schools. Great. Well, thank you both for being here. This is really helpful. We're going to keep an eye on this. This is obviously the story is not going to be over this week. So, but we're going to talk to uh, the uh, PTA from Lakewood next up. But when we come back, we're going to continue the discussion about the pushback. There was actually a, uh, a meeting at the school last night that we'll hear about. But first, see if you can answer this question. True or false, if a local school is taken over by the North Carolina Innovative School District, the state and the ISD will assume funding responsibility for all school operations, including students, facilities, and student transportation. Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer false, which we, you probably should have since we kind of spoiled that one over the last conversation. While the local school boards will no longer have a say in the staffing, instruction, or other educational matters at the schools selected by the Innovative School District, local taxpayers and the school board will still be responsible for maintaining the buildings, making sure they have the appropriate furniture and equipment, and continuing to provide transportation for students. Now joining us for our conversation, we have um, Patsy, I mean, sorry, Lindsay Kennedy. I'm sorry, Lindsay Kennedy. She is the current secretary of the Friends of the Lakewood Elementary PTA. You also served as president of the PTA for two years, and you are a parent of a second grader. Is that what I understand? Terrific. Well, well, thanks for being here. You. I, I, you um, obviously were talking about the... Um, uh, the Innovative School District. In fact, I know the PTA was one of the groups that organized um, just this week a meeting um, you know, of parents and others uh, who had concerns or questions about what's going on. So my first question to you is, what specifically about this plan concerns you as, as a parent and as a representative of, of parents and teachers at the school? I think what's concerning most to me is that I intentionally chose to send my child to a traditional public school. I believe in public schools. Um, I believe in the system that is currently in place. And for someone to come in and tell me that it's no longer going to be public, we're going to turn it over to a charter company is infuriating. Right. And so, it's like you said, we, we hear the, the, um, the term parents um, having a choice where to send their schools. It sounds like that uh, you feel like that choice is being taken away from parents. Absolutely. Now, we asked uh, Chairman Lee, uh, Chairman Jacobs, about the um, input that they've been able to provide. What's been the engagement with the community, the parents' community, the teachers uh, around this process? Have they been involved? Have they been asked to provide input? Not without um, any sort of pushback from parents in the community. Um, I found out about this decision from the news. Um, I think it's um, just incredibly rude um, to have something that is directly going to affect my child and all these children at Lakewood Elementary and find out um, from the media. Um, we would love to hear from Dr. Hall how this is going to be different. He says it's going to be different from Tennessee. Um, however, we've not seen any evidence that that's going to be true. Um, the only thing that he has said is that um, this is going to be a smaller operation. Right. Now, as I mentioned in the, uh, at the beginning, this is um, in the first segment, 
this school, Lakewood, and the other school on the list are, were both approved by this new process uh, through the State Board of Education for to be a restart school. Um, and from what I understand, you're obviously uh, very familiar with what's going on at Lakewood, mm -hmm. and you have a new principal. So this is so. Tell me about him and sort of what's going on with that process. Um, Mr. Hopkins is an amazing addition to our Lakewood family. He um, was at Jordan High School several years ago. I think my favorite thing about Mr. Hopkins so far is that um, he's had students who are now parents now at Lakewood. Um, to see that community and that family build um, is is just really inspiring. Um, he brings a lot of passion and enthusiasm for all the teachers and the students, um, and we think that he's an amazing leader and can't wait to see what he does for Lakewood. Right, so what do you think um, if this goes forward? Now this is the, from with the way the law is written, if Durham Public Schools set, this says we're not gonna be, we're not gonna turn the school over mm -hmm. to the Innovative School District, if, if Lakewood is one of the ones selected um, in a couple of months. By law, by law, the option is the school has to close. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the, what is the, how does the parent, parents feel about that? It's devastating. Uh, Lakewood Elementary has been open since 1908. Um, I uh, precept pharmacy students at my um, job, and my most recent student was a graduate or, or went to Lakewood Elementary, and I'm constantly seeing people in the community who also went to Lakewood Elementary 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so to close that institution would be heartbreaking to the community. What, um, I mean, um, do you have, um, I guess, some ideas about if this were to move forward, how it could be a partnership? I mean, do you, do you, is it something you just, you just don't think there's, you don't see any reason to even be going down this path? I don't believe that when you begin a relationship like this or a so-called partnership like this, that there is really any hope for any type of working together to make this work. Um, this is not a consensual takeover. This is a hostile takeover. Um, we are um, not in favor of this and we're not going to let this happen. The, just a last word on that. Um, last week, when some of the, the reports came out about the pushback in Durham, uh, the state, uh, there was, it was the state said that uh, the schools had plenty of time um, to, to improve on their own. I think, um, sure, we've had plenty of time, but we've also been um, defunded at the same time. Um, and of course, if you use a measurement that's been concocted um, by the legislature to be a failing school, um, it's it's a barrier that you can't overcome. Um, end of grade assessments and this failing letter grade given to schools is purely nothing but to disenfranchise poor people and people of color. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's not a good measure to use. Right. Well, we're gonna keep an eye on this. We appreciate you being here today and giving us the insights about what's going on at the school with, from the parents' perspective. So thank you so much, Lindsay, I appreciate it. After the break, this week's Leadership Spotlight. Education Matters spotlights individuals demonstrating exceptional leadership in education in North Carolina based on nominations from you, our viewers. This week, we spotlight Michael West and Wendell. We have a student news program here. Good morning, Wendell Wolves. I'm Danielle. And I'm Sam. Welcome to this week's update. We decided to do a, a weekly format and have the kids stress their work on the production and the writing and the planning that goes into a production like this. The stuff that people don't see is often it takes the most work. Technology is not a learning goal, it's a avenue through which we get learning goals. My goal with teachers and students is how can I use technology to make their jobs in, in their respective fields like how do, they, how do I make that easier, more effective, more engaging, um, and more efficient? Giving kids the opportunity to create and develop you know, skills around communication, collaboration, critical thinking, uh, all, of these, all these things that I think traditional schooling models, you know, schooling does not look like in our mind's eye many times. 
using the iPads to create advertisements or using green screens. Uh, so I think helping teachers and students meet somewhere in the middle. Technology to me is about being culturally responsive. Youth is a component of culture and I think technology is a huge part of that culture. I think we spend so much time in public education trying to fix individual fish, but if you see a fish in a lake belly up and you notice that, that something's wrong with that fish and so you're going to probably use tools and tactics that are going to try to address the problems that you think are inherent with the fish. What I think we should do more of in public education is start examining the water. Anytime you can involve kids in the process of their own learning and give them a sense of, of, of autonomy and power in their uh, experience here, is, uh, that's, that's the gold standard for, in my opinion. If you know someone that deserves to be recognized, please visit our website, ncforum.org, and click on the Education Matters logo, and you'll find a link to nominate someone in your community. After the break, this week's final word. A few weeks ago, we had Dr. Eric Hall, the superintendent of the North Carolina Innovative School District, on the program. Now look, I like Eric a lot. He's smart, and I know he cares about students. But I asked him why we would bring a program that had already failed in Tennessee to North Carolina. His answer, he said it depends on the definition of failure. And then he went on to say that our plan was very different than Tennessee's plan. It's hard to see much difference yet. Tennessee started small with just six schools in their achievement school district. Eric and the legislators who champion this plan point out that this is a small, modest pilot of just five schools. Tennessee started with six schools, then quickly expanded to 33. How long before the General Assembly expands ours? We've certainly seen that happen before, such as the private school voucher program that grew from an initial $10 million investment to $145 million recurring annually. Now, as far as the Tennessee Achievement School District's actual track record, it's abysmal. The stated goal was to move the schools chosen for takeover from the bottom 5% to the top 25% in five years. We're now four years in, and all but one of those schools remains in the bottom 2.5% of the state. And the high flyer in the group, it catapulted to the bottom 7%. Now, all 33 of the ASD charter schools in Tennessee are among the worst performing schools in the state. The CEO of a national charter chain was forced to resign due to poor academic performance at ASD schools. And the ASD itself is under federal investigation over allegations of sexual violence at a Memphis charter school. Now, on top of all that, the Achievement School District is now seeking its third superintendent in four years. It's hard to imagine why Durham and Rocky Mount isn't welcoming North Carolina's version with open arms. Rather than learning from Tennessee, it looks like we are making the same mistakes. One of the biggest knocks on the Tennessee plan was lack of community engagement and buy-in up front. Yet in our own state, we have community leaders, elected officials, parents, and teachers saying they don't want to see a private, for-profit charter operator take over their schools. But so far, the response has been, you've had enough time to fix things yourself. We're taking over. And if you refuse, you'll have to close the school. How's that for local control and school choice? That's it for this week's show. One year ago this week, we recorded our very first episode of Education Matters. It's hard to believe it's been a year already. I wanna thank everyone who has been tuning in and watching our show every week. We could not make this happen each week without all of our guests, the team at the Public School Forum, and other education friends that help with the research and topics each week, the awesome production crew here, and most importantly, you, our viewers. If you have ideas or comments about the show, please email us at educationmatters at ncforum.org. Make sure you tune in next week. Our topic is Black Teachers Matter, a look at some pretty remarkable research done here in North Carolina about the impact of teachers of color. We'll see you then. <music>